Hey guys, welcome back. Today's discussion is gonna be about fertility awareness methods. So that is going to be a form of natural family planning for contraception. So to get started, natural family planning or fertility awareness methods do depend on the woman being able to identify the beginning and the end of the fertile period of the menstrual cycle. And we're gonna talk through the different ways that women um, do determine the beginning and the end of the fertile period. The uh, unfortunate problem with fertility awareness methods is they do have a failure rate in the first year of 24%. That does make them some of the least reliable methods in that first year. Now, most of that failure rate, again, in the first year is related to um, fertility awareness methods require a lot of education. So the woman and the partner really understanding how that method works, uh, the woman and the partner communicating exceptionally well, and then um, cooperating together to use this form of contraception. Advantages of this uh, collection of methods is that they are free. They're acceptable to many women whose religious beliefs um, preclude them from using substances or devices to prevent fertility. Um, they promote increased body awareness, which is never a bad thing for women, and they do encourage couple communication. In fact, they're pretty reliant on couple communication for success. Disadvantages, we already said, extensive initial counseling. It takes quite a while to learn how to use these methods and to use them accurately. This is why the first year failure rate is so high. It does, uh, all these methods will interfere with sexual spontaneity. So it is something that you do have to think about in the moment, um, you know, every day of the month. And then it's not certainly never as reliable, even at its most effective, um, it's never as reliable as um, some other contraceptive methods that do involve devices or um, substances. There are no side effects to fertility awareness methods. There are no long-term effects, which those are good things. Um, and the only contraindication for most of the fertility awareness methods is having an irregular menstrual cycle. Um, most women will be very successful or more successful with these methods if the menstrual cycle is very regular. Okay. Um, so based on understanding the changes that occur throughout the ovulation cycle is how we are going to teach women fertility awareness methods. So therefore we as nurses or healthcare providers need to have a really good understanding of that menstrual cycle and the changes that are occurring. Um, these methods use menstrual bleeding, so menstruation, um, cervical mucus changes, and basal body temperature to predict ovulation. And so when you're using or when women are using these methods, it does require a period of abstinence um, at certain periods every single month. Let's start with the basal body temperature method. This is um, based on the understanding that the temperature usually drops just before ovulation and then rises and remains elevated for about three days after ovulation. So the rise in temperature is res in response to increased estrogen levels. And so women will abstain from intercourse on the day the temperature drops and for three days of elevated temperature. So what this means is women, women are taking their um, temperature. Now you are using a very specific basal body thermometer. You can't just use your run of the mill oral thermometer. This is a specific thermometer um, and you are using it every single morning. Um, before you rise, women do this before they get up in the morning, they, they, they take their temperature and then they're plotting it every single day of the month because without plotting it every day, they won't pick up on that subtle drop and, and, and an even more subtle increase. So we're not talking about an increase of one or two or three degrees. Um, we're talking about an increase of 0 0.2, 0 0.3 or 0.4 degrees. So here's what it, um, or here's the way uh, the menstrual cycle is actually running um, and, and how it's affecting the temperature. So you can see here's your basal body temperature and here is your drop. That's in response to an LH surge or a luteinizing hormone surge. And you can see that also corresponds with your estrogen peaking um, and your progesterone starting to rise. 
and then you get a spike in the temperature. Again, that's about progesterone rising, and then that temperature stays elevated for about three days. If we look at it on a temperature chart, this is what women will use to chart their temperature. You can see that we're um, just tracking along pretty consistently with temperature. Here you see the drop, and here you see the spike in temperature. It does stay elevated for about three days, and then it levels off. You're not watching for it to drop all the way back down to where it was before ovulation. You're just watching for it to drop down and then um, stabilize out. So it's safe to have intercourse before um, the temperature rise, and it's safe to have intercourse after. You abstain from the day the temperature drops for three days after. The next method is the calendar rhythm method. The calendar rhythm method is based on the assumption, and, and I say assumption because all women's bodies um, function a little bit differently, but it's based on the assumption that ovulation in a regular menstrual cycle occurs about 14 days before the start of the next menstrual period, so roughly in the middle of the cycle. Sperm are viable for about seven days, and uh, an egg is viable for about 24 hours. So when we use those assumptions, we can start to use the calendar rhythm method. Now, this is the most reliable, un, I'm sorry, this is the least reliable of all the fertility awareness methods. And the big problem with the fertility or with the calendar rhythm method is number one, women need to have very regular menstrual cycles for this to work um, because they're only relying on the assumption that ovulation happens in about the middle of the menstrual cycle. So you can't rely on that assumption if your menstrual cycles are not very regular. The other problem with this is that women really need to trend about six months of data. That's how they know that their cycle is very regular. So they're, they're calculating and trending six months worth of data before they start to completely rely on this as a, um, a fertility method. So we don't see this used completely by itself very often because like I said, it is the least re reliable. The next method is gonna be the cervical mucus method. This is sometimes called the ovulation method or the Billings method. This is an assessment of cervical mucus. The cervical mucus does change in response to hormone levels in the body. And so when we assess the amount and the character of that mucus, it gives us an idea of where we are in the menstrual cycle. So women will abstain from intercourse from the time that she first notices clear mucus that is stretchy and slippery until four days after the last wet mucus. So estrogen dominant mucus is the clear stretchy mucus and that mucus is very permeable to sperm. Sperm have no trouble getting through that mucus. Um, that mucus is called spin barket. So estrogen dominant mucus is what women have when they're the most fertile. The other times of the month, we call it progesterone dominant mucus. It's thick and it's sticky and it traps sperm. So it makes it much harder for sperm to get through that mucus and actually reach the egg. So again, women abstain from the time they first notice the clear, stretchy, slippery mucus for four days after the, the last wet mucus. So the last wet mucus and then you wait four additional days. Um, this is the only fertility awareness method that can be used by women who have an irregular cycle. And the reason is because even if the cycle is 28 days one month, 32 days the next, you know, 22 days the next, 48 days the, the next, um, the cycle always responds to estrogen and progesterone. And so mucus response will still be the same regardless of the length of the cycle or the irregularity of the length of the cycle. The symptothermal method is where we're gonna put all of these methods together and that's actually gonna be the most reliable. So when women um, use basal body, cervical mucus changes, um, and they track cycle days, that's when we get the most success with fertility awareness methods. Um, women using this method will also be aware of increased libido, which happens during fertility, um, abdominal bloating or middle smirts pain, which happens mid-cycle, middle smirts is mid-cycle abdominal pain, so around the time of ovulation, 
Um, and then of course they're, they're tracking their temperature. So when we use all of the methods combined, we tend to get the best results. And then last but not least, I wanna talk about the lactational amenorrhea method. So clearly just by the name, this method is only gonna be used by women who are lactating. But let's talk through this method for just a minute. It can be very, very effective, a less than 2% failure rate if some very specific criteria are met. So let's talk through that. Um, this is only a temporary method. It's only for women who are exclusively breastfeeding with a high consistency. So we're not going back and forth between pumping and bottles and formula. This is a mom who is only breastfeeding, putting the baby to the breast eight to 12 times in 24 hours and completely emptying the breast at every feeding. So the, the way that this method works is prolactin is what um, stimulates milk production in the postpartum mother and prolactin suppresses estrogen. Well, we need estrogen to ovulate. So as long as the mom is exclusively breastfeeding, prolactin level stays really high. So estrogen gets suppressed and that's what causes these moms to not have a menstrual cycle because um, ovulation is suppressed as long as prolactin is high. But as soon as that mom starts to maybe goes back to work or decides to have a date night and give the baby formula or starts to supplement with formula and now we're maybe only feeding four or six times a day at the breast and then we're pumping a little bit, but then we're supplementing with formula, prolactin starts to fall, okay? And at some point, estrogen and progesterone are gonna surpass, so I'm sorry, uh, estrogen is gonna surpass prolactin and now mom's gonna ovulate. And remember we ovulate before conception. So that's the real danger with lactational amenorrhea is mom is not gonna know that ovulation or estrogen has risen and ovulation has occurred before there's that risk of conception. So again, this is only used in moms who are really, really committed to exclusive breastfeeding. It works the best in a mom who has never had a menstrual flow since birth. So she's never had a period since having the baby. And it works best when the babies are younger than six months. After six months of age, we start to introduce solid foods to the baby. And so naturally, even though they're growing, as we supplement food, they are probably sucking at the breast less and less. And so you do get a natural decrease in prolactin um, as we prepare at 12 months of age to start to wean that baby onto to solid food completely. So um, under six months, no menstrual flow since birth and exclusive breastfeeding. Um, another key point to make sure that women understand is that breastfeeding sessions should be no more than four hours apart. So this is very consistent breastfeeding to keep the prolactin level high enough to suppress ovulation. Um, at night, you can go six hours once, one six hour stretch at night, but the rest of the time we need to be no more than four hours. We also need um, to breastfeed um, in a sufficient duration to completely empty the breast. And remember we're doing no bottle or formula supplementation. Okay, hopefully that was a good explanation of fertility awareness methods. Of course, if you have any questions, you can certainly reach out to me on social media or you can leave a comment below. Have a wonderful day.